Welcome to Research Methods Week 2. Hi, I'm Ms. Fahib and today we're going to be going over some things that we need to consider before we conduct an experiment. So how we pick our participants, um, sampling, variables that could affect our results and experimental methods. So just to note, your teacher will go through these in more detail, but it's really important you understand the basics before you come in for lessons. Otherwise, you're going to end up being really confused, and that's not a good thing. So let's start off by looking at sampling and understanding what sampling is. So sampling is a method used to select participants or to sample behaviours in an observation. Now we're looking at sampling in terms of selecting participants for our experiment today and we'll come on to that second part in the next lesson. So our target population is the group of individuals a researcher is interested in studying. So for example that could be students in London. At the end of the study the researcher wants to make a statement about this group of people. So the researcher wants to make a statement about all of the students in London. As you can imagine, there's loads of students in London, so that's quite a huge target population. It's near impossible to be able to do an experiment on all of the kind of target population, so it's important that the researcher takes a sample, a smaller sample, that is representative of the whole target population. So that way, after they've run their results, they can make generalizations about the whole target population just from the experiments they'd run on the selected sample. Now, there are loads of different types of sampling, um, and we're going to go through each of them in today's lesson. The first one we're going to look at is random sampling. Now, random sampling is a sample of participants produced by using random techniques. So every member of the target population has an equal chance of being tested. Now, there are quite a few different random techniques we can use in random sampling, and I'm going to go through some of them with you now. So the first one we could use is the traditional lottery method. So this is when you allocate a number to each of the members of the target population, um, put all the numbers in a lottery, and the number that comes up will be the participant that will be in your sample and will be in your experiment. You could also use a traditional name in a hat method where you put all the names of the people in the target population in a hat and then pick out a name and the name that you pick out is the person that will participate in your experiment. So, you could also use a random number table where, again, each of the members of your target population will be allocated a number. And using your finger, you will kind of randomly put your finger somewhere um, and choose the participants that way. You can also use the random number generator that's on your calculators. Now, each of these sampling methods have strengths and weaknesses. Now, a strength of the random sampling is that it is unbiased. Each member of the target population has an equal chance of being selected. However, it can take quite a lot of time. So, there is a, such a huge target population when we are looking at students in London. Imagine having to allocate a number to each of these participants or imagine if we use the traditional kind of names in a hat method writing down all of the names of every single um, person in our target population can take us ages so it can be quite time consuming to do random sampling if there is a large target population now the second type of sampling we're going to look at is opportunity sampling. Now this is when a sample of participants is produced by selecting people who are most easily available at the time of the study. So if, if I asked you guys to do an experiment for me at school, 
An opportunity sample might be just to go to the common room and pick whoever's there at that time. Now, as you can imagine, a strength of that would be it's pretty easy to find your participants. All you've got to do is look around you. You don't have to do very much to get your participants. However, a downfall of that is it can be biased. It doesn't necessarily mean the people around you are representative of the whole school population. Right, the next one is a little bit tricky but you will get the hang of it and um, we're going to do some more practice on stratified sampling in lesson. So stratified sampling is when subgroups are identified within a population and participants are obtained from each strata in proportion to their occurrence in the population. So what I mean by this is, for example, in our target population we may have 60% males and 40% females. Our sample that we pull from the target population needs to be in proportion to the male and female occurrence in the target population. So our sample size needs to be 60% male and 40% female. Now, we select the participants, 60% males and 40% females, using random techniques that we learnt before. A strength of stratified sampling. The next type of sampling is systematic sampling. So this is when we use a predetermined system to select participants. So for example, selecting every second or tenth person from a phone book. But we're looking, if we're looking in terms of um, the target population as school children, it could be every second or tenth person on the register of all the school children in London. Now the same number has to be applied consistently. So if we are choosing every second person, we need to go in multiples of two. A strength of this type of sampling is that it is unbiased. Each member of the target population has an equal opportunity of getting picked. However, it is only truly unbiased if we use a random method to come up with the number that we are using to pick the kind of which system we're going with. So if it's every second person, every seventh person, that number that we come up with needs to be random and we have to use a random method or random technique to actually come up with that number. The last type of sampling we're going to look at is volunteer sampling. So this is exactly what it says it is. Um, those that volunteer will be your participants. So you could advertise in newspapers, notice boards or on the internet. Um, for your participants. A strength of volunteer sampling is that we have access to a variety of participants. However, a problem with this type of sampling is volunteer bias. Now, the people that come forward for our experiment may be participants with more time on their hands, they may be more helpful, they may need money, um, if you only advertise maybe in a certain type of newspaper, so for example, if we only advertise in the Sun newspaper, we, only, we may only get a, um, a kind of a selection of volunteers who are quite similar because they read maybe a similar newspaper. So that is the problem when it comes to volunteer bias. Right, so... The next thing we're going to look at today are variables. Now you can pause it here, have a little break if you want, if you're feeling like that was quite a lot of information, or you can troop through um, and kind of continue on. Now, variables. In an experiment, we want to ensure that our IV, our independent variable, is the only thing affecting the dependent variable, so we can establish cause and effect. So we really want to kind of come to the conclusion that the only reason we got our results in the first place, so the only reason that our kind of our results came about was because of the change in our independent variable and because of the manipulation we made with the independent variable. 
So, for example, if we look, think all the way back to the experiment on marijuana and reaction time, we want to be sure that the only thing that affected the reaction time was whether or not the participants had marijuana. In order to establish cause and effect, and to make sure it was only our IV that was affecting the DV, we need to control something called extraneous and confounding variables. Extraneous variables are variables that change between the conditions, so other than the IV. So between each of the conditions, so with or without marijuana, um, they're the two conditions we're talking about, and they are variables that could potentially change between any two conditions. They could be quite difficult to control. So it could be, for example, how tired the participants are or the temperature of the room. They're also known as nuisance variables because they're quite annoying and they muddy the water and make it more difficult to detect a significant effect and to establish whether it truly was the independent variable or the change in the independent variable that caused our results to be as they were. A confounding variable is a variable that is not the independent variable but varies systematically with the IV. Okay, so I know I just said that and you're probably thinking, what is she talking about? What does that even mean? Let's break it down a little bit. So if we think back to our experiment on the effect of marijuana on reaction time, if we ended up somehow with older people in the condition with marijuana and younger people in the condition without marijuana, age would act as a confounding variable because that may be the reason we got the results we did. So it may not have been whether or not they have had marijuana that kind of impacted the reaction time. Age could have been an alternative independent variable that could have messed up essentially or confused and confounded our results. So this can stop us from establishing cause and effect because in this case we can't necessarily say the IV, the independent variable, whether or not they were given marijuana, would be the only factor that will affect the reaction time. Age now acts as an alternative independent variable and a confounding variable and has confused our results. So we actually can't now say that marijuana affects reaction time because there was a confounding variable that has potentially confused our results. Now, that was quite a lot to handle. If you need another break or if you didn't take one before, take one now. Pause the video. Um, if not, keep trooping through. There is only one section left um, and it won't be long before you finish your homework. Okay, so lastly for today, we are looking at experimental methods. Methods, not design. Experimental methods. So, how can we in kind of avoid the extraneous and confounding variables that we were talking about before? Well, one way is by choosing how we conduct our research. The different types of methods that we can use in research or that we do use in research are experimental methods and non-experimental methods. Today we are focusing solely on experimental methods um, we will come to non-experimental methods later on. In the experimental method, each of the four methods have characteristics in common, right? So they all have an independent variable, a dependent variable, and there will be at least two conditions in which participants produce data just like the experiment we looked at before. Now, one type of experimental method is a lab experiment. So a lab experiment is a method of conducting research in which researchers try and control all of the variables except the one that is being changed between the experimental conditions. 
So the IV, the independent variable, is manipulated and changed, and the effect it may have is called the dependent variable. Right, so I'm going to give you an example to make it a little bit more clear to you. If we think back to our experiment on the um, effect of marijuana on reaction time, this was an example of a lab, lab study um, as it was controlled in an often um, kind of, it was a highly controlled experiment and it was in an artificial setting, all right? Um, a lab experiment doesn't necessarily mean it has to be in a lab, but if it's somewhere where the um, environment is very much controlled and can be considered artificial, that would fall under the category of a lab experiment. So the experiment that we did with the effects of marijuana on reaction time would definitely fall under this category. The second type of experimental method is a field experiment. Now a field experiment is a way of conducting research in an everyday environment. So it's somewhere that's not artificial, such as a school or hospital, and kind of doing an experiment somewhere where participants are used to. The independent variable is still manipulated here by the researcher, and the dependent variable is still measured, but it's actually harder to control the extraneous variables because people are in their natural settings, and the experimenter doesn't have as many kind of as much control over what happens because they are in a setting that is not a lab. The next experimental method we're going to look at are natural experiments. A natural experiment is one rather than being manipulated by the researcher the independent variable to be studied is naturally occurring so the participants can't be randomly allocated to the conditions. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a natural experiment. So say, for example, a researcher wanted to research the development of children who have been adopted and compare them to children who hadn't been adopted. Those two groups and those two independent variables, whether or not they had been adopted, were naturally occurring. They're independent variables that have already happened. It would be highly unethical to deliberately put a child up for, um, or children up for adoption, just to conduct the study, right? So although it's maybe not impossible to manipulate the independent variable here, it would be kind of highly unethical. So the independent variable has, it's been manipulated, but it's naturally occurring manipulation. So the researcher themselves could not have manipulated the independent variable. Now the next one, the last experimental method, is a quasi-experiment. In a quasi-experiment, it is impossible to manipulate the independent variable. So in a natural experiment, it's pretty much unethical to manipulate the independent variable, but in a quasi-experiment, it's actually impossible. And therefore, some people say, this isn't even a true experiment, because to be a true experiment, you need to be able to manipulate the independent variable. Otherwise, that is not an experiment. So the independent variable in a quasi-experiment is something that cannot be manipulated. So this is something like gender or age. The participants cannot be randomly allocated into these groups, as the groups are already pre-existing. You cannot change someone's gender or age, or if we're looking at kind of um, people who have mental health disorders and people who don't, you can't make somebody have a mental health disorder. It is something that is already pre-existing. So in a quasi-experiment, you cannot manipulate the independent variable. So if we're looking at an experiment that looks at the difference between males and females, this is a quasi-experiment because we cannot manipulate um, kind of whether or not they fit into those groups. Right, so quick warning. It's really important that you know the difference between experimental design and experimental method. 
and it's really super important you do not get these confused so in an exam if you got asked to talk about experimental design you should be talking about how you allocate your participants to each of the conditions so by that I mean independent measures design matched pairs design or repeated measures design the stuff we looked at in the first lesson experimental method on the other hand is what we've just looked at and this is to do with kind of how you um, conduct the experiment and what you do with the independent variable whether or not you manipulate it so obviously that is lab experiment field experiment natural and a quasi experiment make sure you know the difference between these two things and do not get them confused as it's a common error Thank you for listening and I will see you again for week three of Research Methods.